This is what a normal pick and roll looks like. Or this. This is what the Pistons pick and roll looks like. Yeah, we'll take a look at this and all of their problems over the course of this video. Sam Johnson with the pump stage into the corner, Finney Smith. Oh! Dorian Finney Smith forces a timeout from Monty Williams. And they're going to say, last touch by Cunningham. Look at some of the things that will prove to be a bit of a silver lining for the Pistons. The 117 they get. Oh. oh boy, here we go. Sell the team, they're saying. The unknown comic. No. Yeah, remember him? <laughs> the Detroit Pistons have broken the NBA record for most consecutive losses. With their 27th straight loss against the Brooklyn Nets, they broke the record held by the 2011 Cavs and 2014 Sixers. But unlike those teams, the Pistons aren't even trying to lose. You can tell by their interviews and post-game conferences that they're so upset, so embarrassed to be in this situation, cause their players are desperately trying to win. They're not losing due to lack of effort, well maybe a little bit. But compared to the Sam Hinkie era Sixers, where they signed a bunch of G-leaguers and randoms on purpose with the intention of tanking, those teams still did better than this Pistons roster. With every passing day, the chance to sell the team get louder and louder. But just how bad are the Pistons in comparison to the worst teams in NBA history? Are they really as bad as their record indicates? And what are the real reasons they're so bad? How's going folks? My name's Andy, and without further ado, let's get started. To give you an idea of how this team compares, here's a graph of the NBA's worst net ratings in history. The Pistons are not at the bottom, which I guess is a good thing. As of this video, they're tied for the 8th worst net rating in NBA history, losing by an average of 11.5 points a game. Funny enough, the Spurs have actually been worse in this category. Because the Pistons have had a record-breaking losing streak, all eyes are on them. So the Spurs have kind of flown under the radar, even though they also deserve a lot of flack. I'm sure you all know, the worst team in NBA history by winning percentage is the 2011-12 Charlotte Bobcats, who went 7-59 in the lockout shortened season. Honestly, that Bobcats team was very similar to this Pistons team. The Bobcats had a couple of veterans, but mostly a bunch of young players who were recent draft picks, still very raw and inexperienced, in the early stages of their career. It was a rough transition period. Compared to the modern-day Pistons, they also have a bunch of young guys trying to develop and improve, even if they lack the talent right now. It doesn't help that one of their only veterans, Boyan Bogdanovich, has been out for most of the year, and he's the only player on this team who can actually shoot. In his absence, it's made the team's lack of shooting even more unbearable. That's what I want to talk about next. Let's take a dive into the actual problems with this team on the court. First, the spacing. In the modern era of basketball where spacing and pick and rolls dominate, the Pistons are unsurprisingly horrendous at both of these things. Not only do they attempt the fewest number of threes a game, but they shoot them at the second worst percentage. I mean, you could say that at least they recognize they're bad at shooting, so they don't take as many threes. Except they don't do any better when they put the ball on the floor. Pick and roll is the most efficient play that teams use in the half court. And in order to be a great pick and roll team, you need a great ball handler. Someone who can create and threaten the defense after calling for a pick. The only player they have who can do that is Cade Cunningham. Even so, it's still a learning process for him. Cade is running the pick and roll on a ridiculous 45% of his possessions, only eclipsed by a handful of players. But he's only averaging 0.89 points per possession in the pick and roll. Compared to his peers who also run a lot of pick and rolls, Cade's efficiency is quite a bit lower. Of course, the terrible spacing has a lot to do with this. When Cade gets into the paint, the defense is suffocating, because everyone knows the Pistons have very few outside threats. That allows the defense to hone in on Cade, and basically ignore everyone else. 
Every single time he runs it, he gets hounded, but he has no one to pass to. While it's clear he's going to be the Pistons franchise player, you know, hopefully, there's gonna be growing pains. Being a part of the worst team ever is one hell of a growing pain. Essentially, the Pistons are super weak at the two most important aspects of offense, spacing and pick and rolls. Their problems run deeper than just that. Their bigs have failed them. When you think of big men busts in recent years, Marvin Bagley and James Wiseman come to mind. The Pistons happen to have both of them. It's not their scoring and finishing ability that's problematic. They've had some good games here and there, and compared to the rest of the team, they're good at finishing at the basket. It's just, they don't do anything else required from a big man. They set soft screens, they can't shoot at all outside the paint, which contributes to this awful spacing. With so many young centers on the roster, you'd expect at least one of them to be able to fade out and pop a jumper. And of course, the most important skill set you need as a big is defense. They're supposed to be the anchor that holds down the paint, but Bagley and Wiseman look completely lost sometimes. Truth be told, the entire team's defense is severely lacking. From the top of the perimeter to the wings to the paint, they rank near the bottom at defending every area of the floor. Boyan Bogdanovich is probably the biggest culprit, because it seems like he can't stay in front of anyone. In the past, he's been the Pistons' most effective scorer, but he gives up twice as many points at the other end. I feel like he doesn't deserve as much criticism, because he's coming back from a bad hamstring injury. The team has to play him though, even when half injured, he's like the only consistent shooter. Now, let's take a look at something else. In particular, the management of the Detroit Pistons. Over the offseason, the organization made a huge, huge push to acquire Monty Williams. And huge is an understatement. Team owner Tom Gores and Pistons GM Troy Weaver both conducted a massive effort to convince Monty Williams to become head coach. Oh, they recruited him so freaking hard. They wanted him so badly that they offered him the largest contract in history for a head coach. Six years, $78 million, with incentives that could pay him over $100 million. This was after Monty turned them down multiple times. I think when people first heard about this, the reaction was, well, at least the Pistons are making an effort to try and win, right? Now that the losses have racked up, I understand why he got fired by the Suns. Monty, he seems like a nice guy, but his rotations are all kinda whack. Even with the team's lack of shooters, Monty somehow makes it even worse by playing multiple centers at the same time, compounding their spacing issues even further. It doesn't help that I feel like a lot of players are seeing their roles change, and they're not adapting too well. For example, Isaiah Stewart is trying to transition into being a stretch four to make room for Jalen Duran at center. Killian Hayes is giving up the ball handling duties to Cade, but he's also struggling to play off the ball because he's never done that before. Asar Thompson is the most recent lottery pick, and he projects to become a typical jack-of-all-trades wing player. But the thing with these guys is they're usually not good at any specific thing, so it's harder to shine on a bad team. And then you have some busts who are trying to prove they're not busts. It's the responsibility of the coaching staff to manage these guys, to put them in the best position to succeed. There's just a lot of conflicting roles and misfits. This team clearly has an identity issue, and the young guys did not develop the way they hoped. One could look at this Piston situation and think, hey, they're still young and have plenty of time to grow. However, compared to other teams who started rebuilding after the Pistons, They've made massive strides in their development. The Orlando Magic, the Houston Rockets, the Pacers, they're way further ahead. For the Pistons, it's been slow. A very slow process. And there's questions if Cade Cunningham really is that guy. Can he really be the face of the franchise? He's shown he has the talent to do so, but it's come in spurts. He's never done it on a consistent basis since entering the league. Let's wait and see what happens down the road. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope y'all enjoyed the video. And of course, as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.